Hello, everyone joining us today. Welcome to the end of May and what feels like only the second webinar in AutoLeaps 2024 history, which I think it actually is. And normally we uh, put these on every single month, but I think between all of the fall conferences, or uh, yeah, spring conferences that we've gone through, uh, we've been juggling a lot and we wanted to make sure that the next webinar was with the, our very own Cecil Bullard. And so before I get started and as everybody is joining in, which we appreciate you guys taking the time, I did want to acknowledge that we apologize we had to reschedule this. Um, and I'm so glad that we were able to get it back on and see this much interest in this topic. And so uh, before we dive in and I mention the topic and what we're going to be focused on today, I did want to go over some housekeeping notes. Uh, we are recording this session as we do every single webinar um, that we have. Um, we will put this online on on demand. And I want to kind of point out because somebody's already mentioned it in the chat. So um, Previously, we used to do surveys at the end of every webinar, and we would compensate for the responses that would happen on the surveys, because at the end of the day, it's what helps us um, plan and forecast the topics and speakers that our attendees want to hear. Um, at some point along the way, we have had people take advantage of that, and so we will no longer be compensating for the surveys. However, I cannot stress enough that the success of these um, come from your feedback. Uh, and so we would continue to love to have that feedback um, and where we feel like we can reintroduce compensation, we absolutely will. Um, but at this point, that will not be moving forward. So unfortunately, I had to start with some barrier of bad news. But uh, since it was flagged already in the, the channel, I wanted to make sure that um, I take care of that. So uh, this session is being recorded again, and we want to make sure that we create a most interactive uh, session for you. Again, we put these on for you as business owners, service advisors, technicians, whoever is joining us today so that you can continue to evolve as a, as a person in growth um, and then also from a business standpoint. And so generally, uh, these, these types of sessions are uh, held by coaching companies like the Institute that you um, don't always have access to direct access. So I want to say thank you to the Institute for always being willing to put these on um, for our attendees because honestly, it is uh, truly valuable um, that you provide this kind of thought leadership um, so love to have you guys let us know where you're joining from. And without further ado, I want to kind of introduce and align to the topic today. And so it's really all about growth and efficiencies um, from the front of the house and the back of the house. So the topic is unleash the power, double your business from one to one plus to three million um, with our exclusive blueprint. So super excited for you to dive into this Cecil today and really help us understand the efficiencies that can be run um, for multi-shop operations and how, you know, it's not necessarily the point of sale system, the SOPs and bookkeeping, but really how to create champion leaders and teams. Um, and to introduce our speaker today, I think a lot of you guys are very familiar with our very own Cecil Bullard, who is the founder and CEO of the Institute for Business Excellence. Uh, Cecil has spent most of his life in the automotive service and repair industry. He's held every position and operated multiple successful shops he now serves as a consultant, trainer, and teacher. He believes that there is an unlimited opportunity and potential in today's shop and that your business should provide you the life that you want. Uh, so Cecil, thank you so much for being here. We really appreciate it. And I'll let you take over. Ready to go. Thank you, Amber. Uh, sorry that I had to reschedule this. So I apologize oh, myself fine. to everybody. <laughs> uh, lots of events going on and lots of travel and things get messed up. So thank you for being patient with us. Absolutely. Um, we're going to talk. I hate the fact that we have people that go, let me show you how to take your business from a million to a million a month or whatever, because there, there aren't any magic tricks. There's no silver bullet. It's really understanding your business, understanding where your business is, where it needs to be. And, and if you were to run at a certain amount, what does that look like? Really kind of creating the picture for that. So that's kind of 
uh, what we're going to talk about uh, today. So I, I want to start, excuse me, with uh, a couple of different uh, small calculators that I have put together. The one that you were looking at, uh, uh, the one that's going to pop up on the slide. Uh, this is a, a sales goal calculator. Now, you saw a QR code, which will come back to us. Um, and that QR code will allow you to go online and to not only get, um, you know, a, uh, a printout of the PowerPoint that we're using, but also the two different calculators that I'm going to talk about. Here's a, here's a calculator that I, I put together just to say, okay, what's my, what's my labor rate? What's my effective labor rate? How many people do I have in my shop? What should I be doing? And, uh, there's a few different, um, calculations in this in this uh, uh little calculator excuse me they uh keep changing the size of things on me um so we have a shop that has an hourly rate of 150 typically whatever your posted rate is uh there's only about maybe six to ten percent of shops that actually hit their posted rate and uh so you have this thing called an effective labor rate that's when you add the discounts and the warranties and the things you give away along with whatever your labor rate is, um, then you have a, a specific labor rate. So we've got a shop here with a $150 labor rate. Let's say it's $145 effective labor rate because they're pretty good at managing it uh, with six technicians uh, and two service advisors. Uh, the, the sales goal should be 3.1 million uh, for the, the company for the year. So if you want to know how to go from one uh, to say three, if you're at 1 million now, how many people do you have? What's your effective labor rate? Uh, parts to labor ratio. What's my hour worth? We're going to get into that a little bit. And um, and and so what I want to do is I want to create a picture of what three million looks like. Well, three million in in this shop with a one hundred forty five dollar effective labor rate and and six technicians. It, I would need six technicians. Um, I could play around and say, well, what if I raise my labor rate? Let's say that we move the labor rate up to say 170 and uh, we got our effective labor rate up to 160. Um, what could I do with say five technicians? I don't, I, I've got a, a seven bay shop or an eight bay shop. So I, I don't think I can fit six technicians in. Well, uh, with five techs, um, which would, would also take two service advisors. Uh, the, the rule of thumb for me is, is for about every two technicians, two and a half technicians, I want to have a service advisor. And, and that's about having the time to write the ticket up, build the value for the client, uh, get the job done, help the technician be productive. We'll, we'll talk about that a little bit. But in, in a shop with five techs at $160 an hour, effectively, I, I, need, I, I would do about $2.8 and, uh, and so, uh, we have goals for the company, we have goals for each technician and we have goals for the service advisors. So it, it really starts with creating whatever the picture is. So if I'm doing 1 million and I want to do more, uh, what's my maximum capacity. If I walked into your shop and I saw a three base shop, I would say, okay, well, we probably can't have more than three technicians. And we have had three bay shops that did two and a half million dollars, but it's difficult to do because of the space limitations that we have. I mean, if my hourly rate is right and my effective labor rate is correct and my parts to labor ratios, I'm getting my parts margins correct, then yeah, I could probably do two, 2.2, 2.5 million with three techs, just not what I, what I plan on. It's not, it's not the easiest way to do it. So uh, this is a little calculator that you can get in here and say, well, mess around with the number of techs, the, the, the um, effective labor rate, et cetera, and it'll kind of spit out the, the numbers for you. There's another calculator here that I, I really want you to see. This is, um, this is kind of my main calculator and it, it helps um, owners and managers understand the relationships between margins, average repair order, car count, people, sales, et cetera. So in this business here, we have an owner that wants to make $150,000 a year in a paycheck. Uh, they want to have 300,000 in net profit at the end of the year, additional profit owners get paid in two ways. 
One is I get a check for what I do in my company. If I'm a manager, if I'm a tech, if I'm a service advisor, I get paid for those roles. And then I also get paid for the risk that I have. That's my net profit. Um, I, I only want to work, uh, you know, I want to take four weeks vacation. Uh, I only want to work four days a week in this, this particular shop. Uh, I'm going to need a, a service manager because I don't want to be there every day. So I need somebody that can take that responsibility. We're going to pay that person about a hundred grand a year. And we have about $450,000 worth of rent, utilities, banking costs, vehicle costs, et cetera, uh, insurance, you name it. And, uh, and so this calculator uh, will then tell us what we need to do based on our gross profit margin, uh, car count, uh, effective labor rate, average repair order, and productivity. So we have a shop with 42% gross profit margin. I use 42% and I've used it for many, many years because we, um, we bring in 20, approximately 20 new clients a month as a company right now. And uh, out of the 20, 18, 17, 18 of them have 42%, 43%, 44% as their gross profit margin. Uh, because they're they're unaware of those things, they're not paying enough attention to those things, and so that's why I use that number. Um, I still see it every single day when we're talking. In fact, we were talking to a brand new shop this morning. Uh, I was meeting with uh, in our in our program, and uh, they had a forty two percent gross profit margin. Um, you know, that's not what we want it to be. We want it to be sixty two, but forty two is is the starting point. Um, they have a Posted labor rate here of about 140, but their effective labor rate is only 110. So they're doing oil changes at $80 an hour. Uh, they've got some comebacks where it's $0 an hour. They're having their technicians um, do DVIs and they're paying their techs, you know, three tenths or five tenths to do the DVI, but they're not charging anything. Uh, and they also have uh, probably an issue with diagnostic where they're starting out with an hour and their technician might be taking two or three. And so the tech is getting paid for that because it's an hourly person, but they're not billing for that. So their effective labor rate is lower than they're posted. They currently have an effective labor rate of $110, even though they're posted is 140. And we see this all the time. A current average of pair order is 390. This might be a little low, uh, but for the industry last year, I think on one of the surveys that even AutoLeap did, the average repair was about 356. Mm -hmm. So 390 is not out of the realm. Most of our shops, if you're general repair, are going to be around 750 to about 900. If you're German car, we're going to be somewhere between about 1300 and 2200 for an average repair order. And uh, our, for our diesel shops, their average repair orders are in the 3000 to $4,000 range. So this shop would be a general repair shop, uh, might do 20% tires, whatever, and they have a $390 average repair order, uh, which is 1.8 hours a car with $110 effective labor rate. We're assuming, if you look over here on the right, that the parts to labor ratio is 45% parts, 55% labor, and that would be of 100% of what we sell, how much of that is parts, how much is of that is labor. Um, they have four technicians in this shop. It's probably a seven, eight bay shop, and uh, they have 72% productivity. And the reason I, I use 72% productivity is because that's where we are as an industry. Um, a lot of the shops we work with are doing 100, 110. Um, many of the shops are at 90%, but as an industry, we're about 72%. And now that's, this calculator will also tell me Okay, this, if this is what you want to earn and this is where your business at, is at, in order for you to earn what you want, you got to do $2.4 million in sales approximately, which is a little over uh, $9,200 a day. And uh, you're going to need 23 cars, uh, 23.7. So let's say 24 cars in your shop every day. And you're going to need 7.3 technicians to get the work done because of your productivity. And... Uh, if you need another 11 cars a day because you don't have them and you spend $69 to bring a new customer in, it's going to cost you another $201,000 um, to uh, 
to market and bring the right number of customers in. And uh, no matter what you do, uh, because your tech is $33 an hour, uh, and you have a load of uh, about 30% on the tech FICA FUTA workers comp, it really costs you 42.9, but with the productivity of 72%, your cost per hour is $59.58. So for every average hour that you bill out to a customer um, or you, you, your real cost for that hour is $59.58. And so you don't have the margin you need. Um, down here, it's telling us that if we really had uh, 100% productivity, that we could be $107 an hour and 25 cents. But with our current productivity, we need to be $149 an hour uh, effectively. So we got some work to do. We kind of know now, hey, I can uh, increase our, our, our uh, effective labor rate. I can pay attention to some of those things, bring that up. And uh, it will lower my cost and put more money in the bank. Uh, the other thing that we're seeing here is that we're going to lose about one hundred thirty-eight thousand dollars, almost one hundred thirty-nine, to productivity. Meaning, I've got these techs, these four guys, and they're supposed to be billing eight hours a day, so I should be billing thirty-two hours out every day. But because we're only seventy-two uh, percent productive, we're only billing about um, uh, what would that be? Twenty-one, twenty-two hours. So we're we're not billing enough hours out and our cost for labor has gone up, which is, is hurting us. So now I'm going to fix some things because I want to do 3 million or I want to at least make the money that I want to make here. So I've got to go in and fix gross profit margin. There are multiple ways to do that. I can raise my labor rate. I think uh, uh, every consultant in the world is going to look at your labor rate and say, let's bring that up some. Uh, I can... Uh, work with my staff and create um, more effectiveness in when we're charging our labor rate and what we're charging. I could go through my can jobs, bring those up a little bit. Uh, uh, I could get my parts matrix in place, uh, bring my parts margins up. Uh, uh, CISO wants 62% with loaded labor. Uh, we're going to put 58 here. It's 42 right now. So we're going to fix a few things, get to 58%. When we're at 58%, what, what's, what's cool now is now I only have to do 1.724 uh, million or about uh, $6,700 a day instead of a little over 9,000. And uh, I only need five cars, so I don't have to spend 200,000. I can spend $88,000 to bring those extra five cars in. And I don't need seven techs. I only need 5.3. Um, I'm not done because I'm still losing $138,000 to productivity. I'm not done here because the business is, uh, I've got to go hire techs and I've got to bring cars in and I don't want to spend that money. So what I am going to do is I'm going to work on my effective labor rate. I'm going to, um, I'm going to maybe lower what I'm paying the technicians for the DVI. We're going to work on the speed, get it down faster, uh, I'm going to look at my can jobs, make some minor adjustments there. I'm going to be very careful about uh, diagnostics um, or testing. I'm going to have three different levels. So um, we're not always going to start with an hour and we're certainly not going to stay with an hour. I'm going to teach my techs that when they've spent an hour on the car and run some tests, stop and tell me what what else you need to do and how much more time so we can get to our customers and sell that additional time. We're going to move our effective labor rate up. We're not going to change our posted rate of 140. We're just going to move our effective labor rate. We're going to come up to say 135. Um, at 135, uh, I still need five cars, but now I only need a third of a tech. So I don't need uh, five techs. I don't need seven techs. I'm starting to get to a point where my techs can do the job. Huh. Now, the other thing we're going to do is we're going to increase our average repair order. We're going to do it in multiple ways. We're going to do it by bringing better customers in. Uh, we're going to change our marketing a little bit. We're going to do it by building better relationships. We're going to do it by helping uh, train our service advisors to be able to sell better. So we're going to raise our average repair order. Now, I said 
if you're a general repair shop and you're working with us, we're kind of setting the target around 750 ish. Uh, we're not going to go to 750 here. We're just going to bring it up to, let's say we bring it up to say 580. So, um, you know, we're going to sell one more thing on every other car that comes in. If we go to 580, how many more cars do I need? Now, the cool thing here is now I can be a little more selective and I'm not spending anything more on marketing than I'm currently spending because I don't need to bring more clients in. In fact, you know what? I want to have more flexibility because I don't want to work on anything that's more than, say, 15 years old. So I'm going to bring that um, average repair order up to 620 instead. And now um, I can be even more selective on the cars that I'm actually going to work on. And by being a little bit selective, it's actually going to help me move some other things up because I'm, go I'm not going to work with the guy that wants to bring his own parts in or the guy that's going to argue or fight with me about everything. Uh, I'm going to work with a, a little better uh, customer. I'm going to be a little more selective about the cars I bring in. And I think if you're a shop owner, you understand that you know, no matter what, every once in a while, the wrong customer gets in. But sometimes when you're desperate because you don't have enough work, you take in things that end up biting you and, and they're not, they, they're hard. The customers are hard to deal with and ultimately they're not profitable for us. So we're going to work on that. And by having a higher average repair order, uh, doing a little better inspections, uh, doing a little better sales, uh, bringing a little bit better customer into our business. Now uh, it's going to give us this flexibility. I still don't like the fact that I'm losing $138,000. Um, so we're gonna we're gonna fix that. Uh, but before I do, um, if you have questions about this, I want you to ask them. Uh, Amber's keeping an eye on that for us, and certainly at the end, we will get to all the questions that we can in the time allotted. Uh, a lot of people want to make sure we get through the material, so we're gonna hold off a little bit on questions. And uh, if she gets a really great one, she'll probably uh, ask me. Um, we're gonna increase our productivity now. Part of that might be pricing. Part of that will be in our by fixing our effective labor rate. Part of that will be by having multiple uh, uh, labor rates. Part of that will be um, by by fixing our processes in our business and making sure that our uh, our um, estimating process is faster and and more accurate by making sure that our our um, scheduling process is is better. Uh, by creating better flow through the shop, um, we're going to be able to increase productivity in the shop. So we're going to work on those processes. If you really want to run a, a very successful $4 million shop, that's not hard to do. It certainly isn't easy because not many people do it. But if you understand your processes, if you look at the flow through your business, and you create more productivity, then you're going to bill out more hours and you're going to do higher numbers, which is going to kind of improve everything. Now, we're not going to go um, uh, above 100%. Uh, however, I do have shops that are using a labor matrix at 1.2 or 1.3, meaning they're marking up book time labor by 1.2 or 1.3. There are other things that we could certainly talk. We could do a, a whole series of webinars on how we charge for labor and what we do and how we do it. Um, so I, I do have shops that are doing that and they are getting more than a hundred percent productivity, meaning a tech works eight hours at the shop and is actually able to bill out 10. My shop ran at 119% over the six years that uh, the last shop that I ran. So we're going to move that to a hundred percent. By, by working on our processes and working on, uh, uh, you know, how we do this and what we charge and getting our margins and, and fixing these little issues, we're going to be able to move our productivity up. When we do, um, I now can do it with, um, with four tags. In fact, in this shop, I can actually do 1.7 with 3.1 techs. Well, I, I don't know what a 0.1 tech is. So you know what? Let's move our productivity up a little more. Let's get to 105%. Um, uh, and at 105, 
uh, I can do it with three techs. So now I can run a business with three technicians. I probably have one and a half uh, service advisors. I can do 1.7 million in sales and I can get everything I want out of my business. Now this calculator uh, is yours to play with. Um, we're gonna go back now. It, uh, uh, Amber, is there any specific questions on the calculator here? So can you elaborate? There is, thank you so much. And I appreciate you guys reposting the QR code because I think some have had a hard time reading this. So the QR it's code- It's gonna come right back up. Yep, it's up right now. So the QR yep. code for those of you who have been asking, this will take you to the calculator that is shown on the screen. So um, can you elaborate on how you calculate effective labor rate? Effective labor rate is a combination of all of my different labor rates. So during a day, uh, let's say that I do, I'm $140 an hour as my normal labor rate. So when I do a water pump, uh, I'm billing that out at $140 an hour. Um, when I do an oil change, however, I, uh, I bill that out at $80 an hour. So maybe I charge $40 and pay the tech five tenths. I want to keep my oil change price lower to be competitive. Then I also have comebacks. So I could have a two hour comeback today where I have a technician spend two hours on the car redoing a job, not their fault, but uh, I don't get any money for that. So that's a zero labor rate. And so when I combine all of those things together, um, that will um, give me whatever my effective labor rate is. So what I do in my point of sale is kind of important. So in Auto Leap, whenever I sell a job, I have time on that job and a labor rate. So let's say that I'm doing a warranty. Well, I have uh, two hours, but zero labor rate. That's how I write the ticket up. Uh, I'm doing an oil change. I have my $40 and my five tenths that's going to my technician, uh, which is an $80 an hour oil change. Uh, if I'm doing... Maybe I have a higher diag rate. Maybe I have a $165 diag rate. So I've got three hours of diagnostic today at 165. And what I do is I run the report that shows me how many hours were billed out and how many dollars that is. And I take the dollars and I divide them by the hours. And that'll tell me what my effective labor rate is. And I'm pretty sure I was looking at AutoLeap yesterday with one of my clients. I'm, I'm, I'm pretty sure that AutoLeap uh, in their normal report has effective labor rate right there. It'll yep. tell you what that is. Yeah. So, um, and most, many of the point of sales today, not all of them, but most of them will have on your, on your financial report that you'll run for the day or the week or the month, it will have an effective labor rate. And what it's doing is just taking the dollars that you brought in for labor and dividing by the hours that were billed out. Okay. So um, I'm going to move ahead uh, otherwise, um, Amber's going to shoot me. So, uh, we're going to come back here. Uh, I'm going to move this up a little so I can get her going. Uh, I we never just, shoot you. what's that? <laughs> would never shoot you. It'd just slap shoot. you. Just slap you around a little bit. How about that? Maybe. Okay. Yeah. Um, the, uh, so really, um, it's all in the math guys. It, it really is about the math and, and uh, you, you need to really understand your business in a financial way um, because it's, a, it's an engine for all intent and purposes. It's built uh, to give a certain amount of horsepower and a certain amount of torque. And uh, if it's not giving that kind of horsepower and torque in the case of a, a business, if it's not creating the, 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 the work that you can sell and the profits that you should make, horsepower and torque, then there's a problem. There's something wrong with the engine. And so when you understand it financially, um, you can look at those financials and a good coach or a good um, coaching company will be able to help you understand those things, with, which can literally make you tens of thousands of dollars. Uh, it's, it's my experience over the last 24, 25 years as a coach and consultant that the average shop is probably losing somewhere around 140 to $200,000 because they just don't understand the financial machine. So they've got a, a vehicle, it's moving down the road. It's just not giving them the torque and the, uh, the, uh, the horsepower that it really can or should. Um, so 
uh, I, in, in, in the, in the terms of understanding, uh, my business and I'm, I'm not sure we see what we're seeing here. Cause my screen is kind of giving me weird stuff. Um, so in the, in the terms of seeing, uh, my business, uh, I have a shop here that's $120 an hour. They have a parts to labor ratio of 45 to 55, 45% of what they sell is parts, 55% is labor. And they have three technicians that can do 24 hours a day for uh, 1,960 hours a year. There are 2,080 hours if my tech works every single day that we're open on a five-day shop. But I know that we're going to have holidays. I know that we're going to have vacations and other things. I'm good now. Thank you, Michael. Um, and so I calculate 1,960 hours, which gives my person three weeks off uh, for holidays and vacation and whatever else. Uh, so if we do that, we're going to do 1.24 million. That's the number. And in a good shop, um, that follows a parts matrix and this is not a matrix class. So I just let me say, if you don't know what a matrix is, you need to go online and find out. We certainly have some great stuff on that. And I know we've done at least one webinar with auto leap where we've discussed that um, my parts expense of the 1.24 million that I'm going to bring in, I've got 18% of the money that's going to go out for parts, which will give me about a 58% parts margin. Uh, I'm going to pay my technicians uh, about 20% of that, about uh, 2.48, uh, uh, $248,000. That's what the three techs will earn. Uh, in this shop, which will give me a 64% labor margin and a cost of goods. Um, you've heard, if you talk to an accountant, you hear cost of goods. What's it cost me to create my product? My product is parts and labor. So once I pay for the parts and labor at 38% of what the customer is paying me, that leaves me a gross profit of 62% or 62 cents on every dollar. I now take that money and I pay my fixed expenses. And for, uh, if you're working with as a client, we divide that into, I think, 13 different categories. Uh, you've got all kinds of, you know, you've got banking costs, you've got debt, you've got um, leases, you've got, uh, um, you know, what you pay your employees, et cetera, that aren't techs. And so we would divide that up. For terms of training, I use three categories. One is sales. What am I paying my salespeople? that are selling my product, my service advisors, managers, whatever we call them in the shop. Um, I pay eight to 10% of uh, that 1.24 million. What do I pay for marketing, for bringing new customers in? I pay six to 9% of that uh, number. So I got 90,000 approximately to spend. Uh, and uh, that leaves me 25% of that number to pay the rent, the utilities, the insurance costs, the banking costs, the truck payments, the uh, gasoline, et cetera. And um, that leaves me a net profit of 20%. One of the secrets when you talk about really running um, the business well and really making the kind of profit that you want to make is to run above uh, 100% productivity. So, and that's hours produced in a time frame. It's, there's different definitions. So when I talk about productivity, I'm talking about hours produced in a time frame. So if I have a technician there for eight hours and I'm billing correctly and I'm, I'm, I, I've got good process, I want that technician to bill out 9.6 hours that I can sell to customers. And when I get above 100% productivity, then I start to make more money. And when I'm making that money, and, and the reason I'm making that money is because I don't have those fixed expenses. So I've already paid my rent, my utilities. So if I can do 1.4 million with three techs, I will net more because I'm not paying that 25% fixed expenses. That's gone. It's all paid for. And, and that's when we talk about turbo mode or turbo where I can earn 24, 25, 26% net. And we actually have shop owners doing that. Now, I also have to understand where things go wrong for uh, businesses like mine. So uh, this is a shop that's going to be at 75% productivity with their techs. And 
they're not really following their parts. They're not marking their parts up correctly for whatever reason, they're not following their a matrix. So the margin on the part is going to be about 42% and the cost is going to be 26%. And the reason why is because we're not following a matrix. And I hear it all the time, Cecil, you, you don't understand because customers are coming in saying I can get that part cheaper uh, by going and buying it myself. And, and my answer is, yeah, I, I do understand. I've been doing this for, I don't know, 43, 44 years now. And we've always had parts competition. There was always a place for my customer to go and buy the part cheaper than I would sell it to them for. And so um, I know there's, it's more, there's more visibility now. I certainly understand that. But also I can go to the grocery store and buy a steak, but my local steakhouse won't cook that for me. So I never, when, I, when I'm going to go out for a steak uh, to a restaurant, I don't think to myself, well, I could bring my own steak and it'll save me 10 bucks. Um, and I could go in and argue with the, the guy in the steakhouse or the gal in the steakhouse and say, wait a minute, I can pay less for this steak if I buy it myself. And the answer is yes, you can, but different things come in the steakhouse. You'd never think about that. We in the automotive industry have to understand that the part that we deliver on your car, there's a lot more going on than just if the customer goes and purchases it somewhere, especially online. Uh, there, there's an estimate that there's like 18% of the online parts are counterfeit. Um, so, you know, I've got a one in five chance I'm getting garbage. Uh, now, labor wise, um, uh, I'm not productive. There's a lot of reasons for lack of productivity. So my, my margin is lower, my cost is higher, giving me a total cost of goods of 51%. And on the left here, this is more common. We see this all the time uh, in shops and uh, giving me a gross profit of 49%. I lost 13% on a, on a million dollar business, 13% is $130,000. So I didn't pay attention to my margins. I was afraid to mark up my parts. I didn't build value for my client. I couldn't sell it. For whatever reason, I didn't believe in it. Um, I didn't have my processes down well. Uh, it took too long to get cars uh, estimated, sold. And so my techs weren't productive, couldn't be productive. And uh, I lost $130,000 in money that I could use to pay my expenses and, um, and or make profit. In this shop, because I have four techs, now I, I need another service advisor, so my sales expense is going to go up, uh, and uh, my marketing expense is going to come down. I'm not making profit, so what's the first thing we cut? Marketing, what's the second thing? Coaching, um, it, neither a good idea, but happens a lot. And uh, my fixed expenses also go up because every time I hire an employee, I need to get another computer, another desk, another chair. Uh, there has to be more parking. There's more insurance costs, uh, et cetera. And so my net profit is, is about 3%. The average net profit in the automotive industry is about 4% today. And, uh, but we really want your shops making 20. Our clients are averaging a little over 19% right now uh, as an average. Um, it's all in the math. Um, so if I have a shop and I have an effective labor rate of $150 and a parts to labor ratio of 48 to 52, meaning 48% of what I sell is parts, 52% is labor, then I, I need to know what my hour is worth. My effective labor rate is 150. Um, the, the calculation is in order to understand what the value of your hour is, uh, effective labor rate times one plus parts over labor. And that'll give you the value of your hour um, at uh, 150 and 48.52. That's 1.92, which means that when I sell an hour of my time in this shop, it's worth 288 dollars. That's what the hour is worth. So I want to do three million in sales. That's what I want to do. And the first thing I have to do is understand you know, what that looks like and can I do that? And how many techs do I need? And what does my effective labor rate need to be? And, and, you know, what do I need to sell my parts for? So if I, if I divide the, the 3 million by 288, that's what my hour's worth. 
that's 10,417 hours that I need to do in a year to do 3 million in sales. Uh, and, and if one tech can do 1,960, that's three weeks off for vacations and holidays um, uh, of production in a year, and that's 100%, then I'm going to need 5.31 techs at 100% or 1,960 hours to do 10,417 uh, hours total and get my 3 million in sales. Now, uh, I don't like the 0 0.31, so um, I'm gonna make a, a change here in just a second. Um, in order for me to do uh, 3 million, I would need 5.31 techs at 100% productivity and an hour that's worth about two hundred eighty-eight dollars. Then I can do my three million. There you go. I got my three million dollars in sales. And then I need the supporting things behind that. You know, do I have a good estimating process? Do I have good marketing that's going to bring me the cars that I need? Um, do I have good techs that are going to be productive, uh, etc.? So I'm going to ramp it up to six technicians at one hundred and ten percent productivity at a $288 value, that means I could actually do 3.765 million, about 3.8 million in sales, um, which would give me at 20%, $745,000 in net profit plus whatever wage I'm earning for working in the business. There are other things that I need to think about here. Um, how many bays do I need? Well, I like two bays per tech, but that's not usually going to happen. So let's say one and a half potentially. So I need probably a, an eight to 10 bay shop to make this happen, um, to do the work. So now I'm building that picture. If I want to do 3 million, this is what I need. I'm, if, if I have a three bay shop, I'm prob probably not going to do $3.7 million in sales. I have to understand my, my limitations and decide if I'm going to live within my limitations or I want to take a risk and go to a bigger shop because I want to make more sales and I want to make more profit. Um, and then I also have the, have the correct systems and process. So I got to go back and I got to look at my productivity and I got to say, are we scheduling properly? You know, most shops that we run into will schedule hundred percent of their work, but their techs are only 66%. So they feel like they're always behind. They're not making the sales they need. And they feel like their technicians are not getting the job done because they're really not. But in many cases, it's because of, I scheduled too many cars and now we're, we're interrupting a tech in a big job, pulling them off for a cheap oil change. And they're not getting that big job done. And then it takes time to get back in the game later. So I got to understand my processes. Do we have a good estimating process? Uh, obviously having a, a great um, point of sale uh, like AutoLeap will help me estimate better and help my technicians get the information uh, that I need uh, to my service advisors in a way that helps my technicians and my service advisors get more work done quicker. Mm -hmm. So I got to look at all my processes and I got to say, Am I doing 110% or am I doing, you know, 80%? And if I'm doing 80%, is it really because I have lazy technicians or is it because I don't have a good estimating process uh, or even maybe we're not um, estimating hours and time properly. So in we're taking time. I, I see this where we're taking time off the ticket. And so instead of charging 2.8 hours, because we're afraid the customer is going to be mad at us, we end up at 2.4 and so we have a 2.8 hour job that we really probably should be charging 3.2, but we're charging 2.4 because we're afraid our customer won't love us. Um, are those things correct? So now I need uh, about 15 cars at 2.78 hours a car, uh, which would give me about a $750 um, average repair order. Uh, and, uh, we have lots of shops doing 2.8, 2.9, 3.2 hours per car, um, because they have a great inspection process. They have the right customers that are willing to buy and they have service advisors that know how to build value and, and sell, uh, the customers, the work that they really need. 
He's so I have quite a wrap up and we are getting close because I know we have questions. Do you have a, Amber, do you have a question? Yeah, if we hit, before we go on this, I think there was a really good question here um, that came through. Do you back tires out of your parts margin calculation? Yes, in most shops, if it's more than two or 3% of sales, I pull tires out. Tires, we're looking for a 40% margin. Most shops that we would work with would be getting in the mid to high 30s. Yeah. Um, yeah and uh, if that's 20% of your sales, then that's going to really screw up your parts margin when you go to look at your parts margin. So we want to look at tires different because they have different margins. Now, yeah. if I'm only selling two sets of tires a month, then I'm not pulling it out. It, it's not going to change my margin that much. So um, our rule of thumb here at the Institute is if it's more than about two or 3% of sales, then we'll pull it out. Like if I was selling a ton of batteries, um, I've got a shop in the Santa Cruz area that literally was last year was selling so many catalytic converters and you have to buy them in California from the dealer. There's nowhere else to buy them. So the margins are less. So we pulled catalytic converters out so we could look at our other margins and our catalytic converter margins separately. Yeah. Um, and I, if you're really paying attention to your business, you probably will say, oh, I can't put that in the pile. I got to pull that out and look at it differently because right now that's what I have to do as part of my business. And so um, that way I'm managing properly. Is that the only one? And then we'll I go got on. One and more. Then I think I've got right. one more and that's it. And then we'll go forward. How realistic is it to expect to have a hundred percent productivity every week of the year? It seems unrealistic to assume it. What is a more realistic expectation in your experience? I ran a shop for six and a half years. The last one that I ran and we had 119% productivity for six and a half years. Um, I, I love it because as a tech, I was a master tech and I beat book time all the time. So it was a, a sense of pride. If you talk to a good tech today and you go, Hey, what, a, you know, can you beat book time? They'll be like, can kill book time. And yet at the end of the day, they're not producing eight hours for eight hours. And mm -hmm. most shops are using a 20 to a 30% multiplier on book time today. So if you're using that 20% multiplier, let's say 20% and your tech is good at what they do. So let's, let's, let's talk about different techs for a sec. I got my C tech and, uh, and that's my oil changer and they do breaks occasionally, et cetera. Well, wait a minute. If you've done a hundred oil changes, don't you think at some point you're going to be faster than you were for the first 10 or 20? <laughs> I love allergy season. You'll have to excuse me. If you do break jobs and you've done 20 break jobs, shouldn't you be faster at doing break jobs than you were? And I think, you know, also, do we base the time on our best, fastest tech? So we've got shops that'll say, well, yeah, it only takes our, our good tech eight tenths of an hour to do a break job. Well, the book time is still 1.8. And, uh, but we're going to charge eight because we want the customer to love us more and we want to be price competitive. Okay, let's go to the bottom altogether and uh, let's be price competitive and let's charge eight tenths of a percent. The only problem is, the only tech that can do it at eight tenths is my best guy and my C guy can't do it at eight tenths. So is it realistic? If you don't believe it, then the answer is no. If you believe that you can do it, then the answer is yes. And I have, you know, if you look at the, the bell curve, a bell curve is how we understand data. And you look at the top front of the bell curve, the top 10%, uh, that would be the, the top 10% of the shops and are they doing more than 100% productivity? Yes, they are. Uh, then you look at the average in the middle, the, the other I don't know, 67%. Now we're at the 67% mark. Uh, that's 67%. And they're doing average, which would be six and a half hours a day instead of eight or nine. Uh, and then you look at the bottom uh, 10 or 15%. And the bottom 10 or 15% are always the lowest performers. And they're techs are doing four hours a day, three and a half. Well, if the top 10% can do it and they're not doing anything immoral or illegal um, or unethical, then can't I do it? And the answer is uh, uh, 10 to 15% of our shops are constantly over 100%. Um, 
the rest of our shops are probably running somewhere around 90% to 95%. And if you looked at 100% or 100% of the shops that when they first come in, they're probably running 60, 65, 70%. Um, I used to argue that you have to do X, Y, and Z. I, I, I don't argue a lot. You won't see me online arguing about productivity or parts pricing or anything. Because if you believe that your people cannot be productive, they won't. But I can tell you, I personally ran a shop for six and a half years where my techs had 119% productivity starting the first month that I ran the shop because we looked at the processes, we looked at our estimating, we looked at what we were doing, and we fixed the engine so that the engine could give us maximum horsepower and maximum torque. So long answer, sorry. Um, I'm going to give you a caution and then I'm going to wrap this up and we'll take a few more questions. Caution is don't listen to the people that are telling you that it's okay to discount and lower your margins because you have to have margin to have profit. It's, I understand gross profit dollars per hour. If I'm doing enough, I'm making the money. The problem is no margin, no dollars. So we have a shop here that has a sales volume of $65,000. That's what they do. And at 60% gross profit, I want you at 62 with loaded labor at 72 to 74 with unloaded labor, meaning loaded would be with the cost of labor, FICA, FUTA, workers comp, medical dental, whatever I pay for my, you know, 401k, unloaded uh, would be without those costs. Um, so at 60% with a loaded labor, I have this shop doing 65,000. They have $39,000 to pay their bills. And uh, it, with a $500 average apparator, that's 130 cars. Now we're going to go, ah, my guys aren't going to be as productive. And when they're not as productive, if we're paying them anything, uh, any kind of a salary or hourly pay, then my costs are going to go up and my margins are going to come down. We're going to bring the margin down by 10%. So uh, we're not going to hit our margins on our parts. We're we're gonna, you know, we're gonna be too emotional about that, and we're not going to look at productivity and flow, and we're not going to fix that. And so at ten percent, I, I have the same sixty five thousand in sales, but I only have thirty two thousand five hundred dollars to pay my bills, leaving me a six thousand five hundred dollars shortfall. Now that's a month. You could take this by twelve months, and now we're talking about seventy thousand dollars. Um, or, or, or right around there. If I have a $500 average repair order, now I need 156 cars. That's 26 more cars. So I have to write up 26 more, uh, tickets. I have to do 26 more inspections. I have to do 26 more test drives. And so what happens to my productivity? Right. And, and so now, because we're not hitting our margins, we're also not hitting our productivity. And, and we also have to spend more money on marketing in order to bring another 26 cars in our business. I'm going to turn it around. And we're going to look at fixed expenses. We're going to come down here to this uh, $32,000 mark. I have a shop that has $32,000 monthly fixed expenses, rent, utilities, salaries, truck payments, banking costs, uh, software costs, um, et cetera. And they're going to make 60% uh, uh, net uh, gross profit. Um, so they have to do, uh, excuse me, my eyesight's not as good because my allergies, $53,000 this month to get the $32,000 to pay their bills because that's their bills. And if they have a $500 average repair order, they need 106.7 cars to do that. Now that's not making any money. That's just breaking even. And now we're going to lower our margin by 10%. I still have $32,000 in bills. So now I have to do $64,400 in sales and my average period is going to come down because I'm not charging as much. Remember my margins are coming down, which means that my profits and my, my average period is going to come down. We're going to go to 450 and at 450, I need 35.6 more cars. Again, 35 more test drives, 35 more uh, getting cars on the rack, 35 more digital vehicle inspections. Uh, 34 of five more times, my tech has to go out front, chase a car down, uh, pull it around back and put it on the rack. Um, it's, it's a much more difficult 
company. And, and, and here we're only talking about breaking even. Imagine if your margins are in the 45% and you have uh, 32,000 at 45%, I got to do 71,000 before I ever make a nickel. And if I my average repair comes down like it will, then I need 61 more cars, 61 more test drives. So don't listen to the people that tell you lower your price, do discounts. Uh, you know, you got to do that. You got to be competitive because the guys that are making the most money are the guys that are not discounting their products and are selling value to their clients. Learn that, figure it out, understand it, know it, live it, and you will make the most money. We work with a lot of clients. We worked with well over a thousand clients in my career. Personally, I've worked with well over a thousand shops and the shops that are doing the best have the highest labor rates. They hold the best parts margins and they are productive because they constantly look at their systems and their processes. There is no silver bullet. Nobody has it. Nobody's found it. It is understanding your business and then working on all the bits. It's like diagnosing a car. I've got a vehicle. It doesn't run well. It doesn't have enough power. Uh, I pull it in, I put the scanner on it, I find out what's wrong, I put the part in place, uh, then I test drive it and I see, did I, did I get them, did I fix it all or is there something else that's wrong? A business constantly will have something that's not allowing me to get the productivity I need. Well, what is that? Let's figure it out, get it out of the way because if I can increase my productivity from seven hours to nine hours, that's going to make me another eighty to one hundred thousand dollars a year, and allow me to pay my technicians a lot more money. The, it, it, I, I I I hate this idea of, well, somebody's got a magic, magic, you know, there's magic beans. Okay, I I don't have any magic beans to sell you. We we um, the grass is not greener on the other side of the fence, and if it is, it's because the person that is managing that grass is watering it right is feeding it right, is fertilizing it, is trimming it, uh, mm -hmm. because that's why it's greener. They're doing the work. And mm -hmm. uh, a good coach or consulting company can help you understand where your vehicle is not running properly and help you get that fixed. All right. We have a few minutes for questions. Let's do it. I love that statement. I think you couldn't have ended uh, the overall presentation on a better note that I think... Uh, it all is in the work that you're doing, right? There, There is no magic wand out there. Um, and I think over time, we all are, if you are on market websites and you're looking at social media platforms, a lot of that conversation is going on, but it is the continual work that you look at your business day in and day out and diagnose it and really understand where issues are going wrong. Um, so a question we had, why is margin less on dealer parts? Uh, I don't know why is margin less uh, because the automotive business is afraid to charge more than the dealer would charge for a part. That's why margins less. Most of the shops we have have a, a matrix that they use on the dealer part in my shop. Routinely, we would charge uh, 25 to 40% more than if a customer could go pick that part up at the dealer. Uh, and so I would routinely charge more for the parts so that I could hold my margin um, dealers today, I just saw an article from somebody, uh, uh, that they got a message from their local dealer that they will no longer discount the parts at all to the shops. So dealers are struggling today for margins and profits. And some of the dealerships are actually now not even allowing a 20% off on a part. And, uh, so I have to make money on parts or I have to raise my labor rate dramatically. So it's either $300 labor rates or we use a parts matrix and get parts margins. Take your, take your pick. Um, it shouldn't be different. I should be able to make margin on dealer parts and other parts. <clears throat> yeah, I love that. I think um, this one, uh, Ryan, I think would be a, a great one for you guys, Cecil, to follow up on, but I am going to mention it. Maybe you can high level. Um, we have two full-time techs and two owners. Us owners are having to wrench a lot as well as try to keep up. I think that's something we hear often. Um, and on top of that, they're trying to find more techs. Um, and we try to focus on handling the diag and pushing repairs to techs. They aren't as strong yet at heavy di diagnostic. How can we and what do we need to do restructure this better 
And when doing our numbers evaluate evaluation, do we need to include ourselves as a tech as well? So that's kind uh, of when num number one, I probably wouldn't have both owners working as techs. I would literally shift one owner to be the tech for a while while we found and built our technicians up. I would want the other owner focusing on running the business. Why are we, why do we have to be the tech? Are we, you know, the other bits and pieces. And so there's a lot in that question. I could probably do a whole three hour webinar on just that one question alone. Um, the problem is, is that when I'm trying to be the worker in the business, I can't be the owner and manager of the business. And somebody has got to look at the systems and processes and how we're estimating and how we're pricing and et cetera. And I understand that the market right now is tough as far as technicians go and that we've got to grow some of our own. And uh, maybe as an owner, I have to spend half my time growing and working and in, in, in the shop, but I also need to spend half of my time managing that business and understanding it so that I can determine what I need to do and put those changes in place. So it gets better and better. And yeah. uh, that's one of the things I think, um, you know, a, a coach or a coaching company can do is help you figure out where to put your best focus to make your best profits. Yeah, I think that's really, I think, Brian, you started to outline that at the end that you manage the business sides of things, but being in the shop really takes you away from building and fixing operations. I think that, you know, I love to bring in kind of personal things as well, you know, as a manager or director managing different operations in a business, right? you can only train so much. And the, the moment that you go back and do work for your employees that are supposed to be doing work, you can't handle it all. And there are things and balls that will be dropped. And Cecil, you and I were talking about this earlier, you know, you can't be everything for everyone or your business. That is why you hire people to do the job that they are supposed to do. Um, and, and what you would kind of hope is that you would, um, you know, make enough profit or figure out how to do that part because then that would allow you to maybe offer more uh, in, you know, we have a, a hiring, training, finding, um, mentoring uh, class. Um, if I can run a, a more profitable business, I can do things in my business that make it more attractive for employees that I might hire. And I'm not just talking about pay, I'm talking about working conditions, I'm talking about, you know, whether or not there's air conditioning or heat. Uh, I'm talking about tools and education and things. Plus, I need to have a pretty good training program. If I'm going to bring this tech in, I really want to have a list of things that I want to get them signed off on that they have these tools and these skill sets because the the sooner I can get them signed off on those things, then the the, the more I can put on their shoulders and the more I can take off of mine. So I want to have a plan for that education because I know I got to do it, but I want it to be most efficient so mm -hmm. that I can uh, spend more time quicker becoming an owner and doing the things that an owner or a manager would do in the company. I love that. I think we can end the note. Um, uh, lots of people saying great classes. So really appreciate that. I wanted to end the note, uh, Tucker, I know he's been to these multiple times. I know you guys speak with him as well, but, uh, just from being in these classes and you talking about margins and raising your labor rate, he said, I have had no pushback from raising prices and not budging on margins. The good customers understand your kids need to eat too. So I think we forget that at the end of the day. Tucker's doing well. Um, he's, uh, <laughs> He's doing well. Yeah. Awesome. Well, we really appreciate it. I don't think that there are any other questions. We will be sharing the survey. Nicole, if we can go ahead and put that in the link um, or in the chat really quick, and we'll also send that out. Just to recap, guys, the session was recorded. Um, any questions that I didn't get to, which I think I got to the majority of them, um, we will make sure that they get answered by Cecil or somebody at the Institute to help you guys with that. Um, and it looks like, uh, they've also just posted, uh, a session to meet with them. So definitely check that out. Uh, we work very closely with the Institute. And so, um, if there's any personal introductions that we can make, please feel free to email me since you have my email and I will, uh, include you guys in an email with Cecil. So, uh, Cecil, as always, thank you so much. And, um, I appreciate it. I think we've got you on the next month.
uh, as well. So I'm raring to go. I think we've got you on. So we appreciate it. I think we'll also see you at the end of the month at Tools. So for anybody that is also going to be at Tools, Cecil will be speaking. I think you guys have three sessions. Is that correct? I, um, I'm teaching three classes there. I think Jimmy's teaching one or two also. So, yeah. Yeah. Uh, so we will see you guys in Pennsylvania at the end of the month if you are going to be there. And as always, we really appreciate you uh, being here and for all of the valuable information that you provide. Thank you for the opportunity as usual, Amber. Awesome. All right, guys. Thank you. Thank you. Have a great day.